What's up everyone and thanks for joining me again this week. Today I want to take a look at common operators that I find that produce performance problems in execution plans. That's not to say that these operators are always bad, it's just that when I see them, I usually look to them first to see if that's where my bottleneck of my query performance is. So I think one of the first operators most people learn when learning to read execution plans are table and index seeks and scans. The general wisdom is that seeks are good and scans are bad because they're a lot slower. And while that general wisdom holds true a lot of the time, it's not necessarily correct all of the time, so it's important to dig a little deeper when you see these operators in your plans. So I've written two queries here, and if we actually run them and look at their actual execution plans, they're gonna take a minute to run. And so here we have the results. For these two queries, if we look at their execution plans, the first one is a seek, so you would expect that to be a good thing, it to be fast, and the second one is a seek, and you would think that that would be fast too. The difference here is this first seek, if we hover over it, we'll see, if we look down at the actual number of rows, uh, it's just set equal to one. So this kind of seek is what we want for SQL Server to use. We want it to go pinpoint exactly the row of data we want, return it, and not return all these other records that we don't need. If you take a look at the second query though, it's also using a seek, so you would think it's good, but if we hover over it, we will once again see the actual number of rows being 1.1 million. So having to read over a million rows, not really as efficient as you may first think by just seeing that seek icon. And the same thing applies to scans. If we go ahead and run this query I wrote with scans, right, big bad scans, they are so slow and inefficient, and we take a look at the execution plan, here's our scan, right? But if we actually look at it, once again looking at the actual number of rows, it only read three rows out of our whole table. In this particular case, the clustered index scan is actually very efficient. I don't, you can't really get it more efficient that when than that with a select star. So in general, while index seeks can be good and index scans can be bad, uh, it's always worth just double checking and seeing if the results are actually meeting your expectations performance wise. And if you are getting scans on queries where you know you're returning just a limited number of rows or a limited number of columns, that might be a great opportunity for you to add an index. Oh yeah, and one last thing. Here we showed clustered index scans. If you ever see table scans, uh, that's a really bad thing. It means there's no clustered index on your table at all. So at the very least, right, there's room for improvement there. You can add your clustered index and you'll almost be guaranteed to get some performance benefit. All right, the second operator I wanna show you is the key lookup or the RID lookup. Just as I mentioned a second ago, if your table is missing a clustered index, you're gonna see this as a RID lookup, which is always really bad. Make sure you add a clustered index, uh, but in general, you'll probably more likely see this as a key lookup. And what that key lookup means is that SQL Server doesn't have all the information it needs in one index, but otherwise that index is really good. It's maybe smaller, it'd be faster to return results from. Uh, but it needs to then go look up values in something like the clustered index to get the whole set of columns that you requested in your query. So just as an example, if we run this next query, we don't get any results, but if we take a look at the execution plan, we'll see this is what our key lookup looks like. So key lookups aren't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, actually, a lot of the time SQL Server uses them in a rational way, right? If you have one non-clustered index that doesn't contain all the data that it needs, it'll use that because maybe the data is stored in the correct order to seek to the rows it needs. And then once it has that filtered result set, go look up those roles in you know, the clustered index to get the remaining data fields it needs. But the thing you wanna look out for with these key lookups is that they occur because one of your indexes is a non-covering index, right? It doesn't contain all the information. And so since key lookups aren't free, right? They're okay sometimes, but they're not free. If you're able to just add one or two columns to an existing index, and it's not gonna negatively impact the performance of the rest of the queries using that index, you will get better performance because now your key lookup query, right, which is gonna to have to loop and go out to the clustered index to look up values, is gonna be able to stay all within your original non-clustered index with these new included columns. So you'll get better performance, just something to double check. Sorting is one of the most expensive operations you can do, and so you want to avoid it when possible. Typically, you avoid a sort by having your data 
indexed in a pre-sorted order so that SQL Server can just read the data straight from the index and have it ready to go. But when your data is not in the order that SQL Server needs it, SQL Server will have to sort it for you. And while you can't always avoid all sorts in your query, you can mitigate the need for SQL Server to sort by either creating an index, right, with the data that's pre-sorted, or if you have a really long query, adding a temp table in the flow of your query, right, to then index that table to have the data pre-sorted and ready to go for the next step. So sorts are bad. Uh, usually I try really hard to get rid of them by indexing. So another type of operator I always look at are spools. Now there's several kinds of spools and they all really do similar things and that is stage the data uh, in an intermediary table for SQL Server to then be able to do further processing on. And while spools serve a great purpose because they often help SQL Server get the data into a format that it needs to be able to continue processing the rest of your query, uh, it comes with a cost. And that cost is that these spool tables are saved to tempdb. Now, saving to tempdb can be bad for many reasons. And not only are you now dealing with new space issues, you can be dealing with contention issues. It's obviously slower because you're taking your data out of memory and writing it to disk, and it doesn't matter if you've got super fast hard drives or not. On uh, SSDs, it's still slower than keeping that data in memory. Uh, so anytime you see a spool, you, you want to take a look and see if there's something you can do to eliminate it. Once again, one way you can get rid of a spool sometimes is to create a explicit temp table in your query, right? Actually write that in your query logic. Uh, it'll still write to tempdb, but at least you get to define exactly how it'll get created, how the indexes are sorted. So maybe not only will that spool, you know, or that temp table get used in place of that spool in one spot, but you can reuse it in multiple locations. And another way to get rid of spools is often just to rewrite your query into a totally different uh, format. I've done a video on that in the past, so I'll link to that in the blog post below and up above, so you can check that out if you're interested. All right, we're closing in on the end here. A few other operators I look at are all the join operators. That's nested loops joins, merge joins, and hash match joins. I've done a whole series on joins in the past, getting really into detail of how they work. So once again, I'll link to those below and you can check them out if you're interested. But in general, right, if you see a merge join, that's gonna be probably the fastest way your data can be joined together. So I don't really give that much consideration. Nested loops joins are pretty common and while you can optimize them, they're usually not the first things I look at. When I see a hash join, however, uh, that is something I do take a closer look at because while hash joins can join huge amounts of data, uh, there is a significant cost to them because they have to pre-compute a bunch of hashed values. And not only that, but those pre-calculated hash values sometimes spill to tempdb, which makes things even worse. So when I see a hash join, uh, I typically am expecting that the data is coming in with no sorting order at all, uh, and it's really big. And so once again, I, I revisit to see, hey, can I index something or add a temp table or something somewhere, right, to avoid having to calculate all these hashes be before effectively then doing a nested loops join, right? That's what a hash join really does. And like I said, sometimes you can't get around that. If you have giant data sets, a hash join is going to be the only thing SQL Server can do to put those together, um, which is one of the advantages of it because it does write data to, uh, to disk when it needs to, when it can't fit it all to memory. But honestly, I always take a look at hash joins to see, is there room for improvement. And finally, the last operator that tends to give me some problems sometimes, uh, especially on new servers that I haven't worked on before, is the parallelism operators. Now generally you probably think of parallelism as a good thing because SQL Server is splitting up the work across multiple CPU threads. They kind of work asynchronously together and get the job done faster than it would have just had been done by one uh, processor on its own. And then the data gets joined back together, returning your results faster. At least that's what happens in the best case scenario. Parallelism can actually have a lot of different problems associated with it. For example, if we take a look at one of these parallelized operators like this hash match, we go over to the properties and we take a look at the actual number of rows. We'll see all the different CPU threads that this operator ran on and roughly the distribution of rows across threads is pretty equal, right? They're all around 50,000 rows. Where parallelism often has problems is when this data doesn't get equally distributed across threads. And that can happen for a number of different reasons. So uh, if you are feeling like maybe you're getting some performance issues because of parallelism, always check there first to see if maybe there was a, a stats problem or something that caused SQL Server to not distribute the data equally across threads. What ends up happening in that scenario is you have four threads and only one of them is really doing all the work. So you're kind of getting tricked into thinking, oh, parallelism, this should be faster when it's not. 
You can also encounter serious parallelism problems on your server when too many of your queries are going parallel. Parallelism isn't free. SQL Server has to take your data and its operations, decide to split it across a number of CPU threads, do its work, and then bring it back together. There's overhead there. If your cost threshold for parallelism is set too low, then SQL Server may make too many queries go parallel, which will cause all the, this overhead to happen when the query probably would have ran faster on just a single CPU thread. So uh, if you do see too many queries being uh, ran in parallel, be sure to check out your cost threshold for parallelism and, and see if that needs to be adjusted. And that's it. Hopefully now you are more familiar with some of these operators that potentially can cause performance issues in your queries. Like I said, I'll reference two different lists. They're both great of uh, SQL Server operators and more detailed descriptions about what they do in uh, my blog post linked in the description below. So be sure to check those out. I include it there, but like I said, these are the most common operators I find trouble with. So if you're new to starting out with SQL Server, you know, don't try memorizing and learning all of them. Focus on just a few of them, get comfortable with them, and then add to your knowledge right as you go and as you troubleshoot more queries. Thanks again for tuning in on this series on troubleshooting execution plans. Hopefully you found it helpful. And if you have, uh, please subscribe so you'll be notified of future videos that I put out and you'll never miss an episode. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time. <music>